on. And we'll pick up where we left off on the Isle of Miletus. And Luke writes, After we had torn ourselves away from them, the elders of Ephesus. Excuse me. I hate to stop you, but where, where did you leave off? What verse? Verse 1. After we had torn ourselves away from them, we put out to sea and sailed straight to Kos. The next day we went to Rhodes and from there to Patra, Patera. We found a ship crossing over to Phoenicia, went on board and set sail. After sighting Cyprus and passing to the south of it, we sailed on to Syria. We landed at Tyre where our ship was to unload its cargo. Finding the disciples there, we stayed with them seven days. Through the Spirit, they urged Paul not to go to Jerusalem. But when our time was up, we left and continued on our way. All the disciples and their wives and children accompanied us out of the city, and there on the beach we knelt to pray. After saying goodbye to each other, we went aboard the ship, and they returned home. We continued our voyage from Tyre and landed at Ptolemus, where we greeted the brothers and stayed with them for a day. Leaving the next day, we reached Caesarea and stayed at the house of Philip the Evangelist, one of the seven. He had four unmarried daughters who prophesied. After we had been there a number of days, a prophet named Agabus came down from Judea. Coming over to us, he took Paul's belt, tied his own hands and feet with it, and said, The Holy Spirit says, In this way the Jews of Jerusalem will bind the owner of this belt and will hand him over to the Gentiles. When we heard this, we and the people were pleading, they pleaded with Paul, not to go up to Jerusalem. Then Paul answered, Why are you weeping and breaking my heart? I am ready not only to be bound, but also to die in Jerusalem for the name of the Lord Jesus. When he would not be dissuaded, we gave up and said, The Lord's will be done. After this, we got ready and went up to Jerusalem. Some of the disciples from Caesarea accompanied us and brought us to the house of Nason, where, he, where we were to stay. He was a man from Cyprus and one of the early disciples. When we arrived at Jerusalem, the brothers received us warmly. The next day, Paul and the rest of us went to see James, and all the elders were present. Paul greeted them and reported in detail what God had done to the Gentiles through the ministry. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you for what you ask of us. And we pray that we could be found faithful to Jesus as Paul was. As we look at what it means to follow Jesus even if it means death, as Paul says. May it encourage us in our faithfulness. And may it allow us to be with those who are an example of who Jesus is. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Amen. In 2011, uh, February 2011 and the March 2011, I had the opportunity to speak at the International International Christian College of Manila. I think it's what the I stood for. And uh, I was there for 10 days over a weekend, taught for seven so on Saturday, my day off, they thought it would be a really great idea because they couldn't set up an all-day teaching time with the elders and the preachers from the local churches that I would instead get some rest and relaxation, which meant getting up at 7 in the morning and getting home at 11 at night, it turned out, before preaching the next morning. But what they did is they, uh, they sent me on a tour of the island of Corregidor. Corregidor was the last bastion of the Filipino people after the Japanese had invaded the island during World War II. It is here where those who were not forced to walk on the Bataan Death March held their resistance. It was here where General MacArthur was called away from the island. And it is there that there's a statue of him facing inward from the ocean. With these words, I shall return underneath. When I think of that statue, I think of what Paul has saying here. As we leave Asia, come back to what we would call the Middle East, as we land in Syria, heading towards Jerusalem, Paul is bound and determined that he will begin, or in this second missionary journey, where it had its genesis and its start. Paul's not been back to Jerusalem since the council in chapter 15. Not since he and Barnabas had their knockout drag out that led to not one but two mission journeys going on. And as Paul is heading there, there continues to be this sense that danger awaits. We got a sense of that last week in chapter 20 when he told the Ephesian elders on Miletus, I will not see some of you ever again. 
We get it even deeper here. As Luke says, everywhere we went, people were getting warnings and saying to Paul, Spirit's telling me something's going to happen to you. Don't go. And then it becomes full bore when Agabus shows up at the house of Philip. And he takes the belt and he ties Paul's hands and says, he who owns the belt, this is what will happen to him. Well, we got a prophecy. Now the question is, why do we have a prophecy? This prophecy is an alert. Now, the question is, is it an alert to Paul to stay away from Jerusalem? Or is it an alert to Paul's companions of what Paul already knows and Paul is already bound and determined for? There's a great speculation. Paul makes it very clear that as far as he's concerned, that's exactly what this alert is. This alert is so Luke and the companions know we get to Jerusalem, I'm probably going to be breaking off for a little while because I'm going to find myself under arrest. The others feel this is alert and a warning going, Paul, Paul, let's just cancel this trip to Jerusalem. And Paul, I don't know if he put his corn cob pipe in, his sunglasses and his military cap and said, I shall return. But he does determine that he is heading back. I want to mention for a second. There was a guy who earlier in the last few weeks predicted that none of us would return today because he said Jesus was going to return yesterday. He interprets prophecy the same way that the companions of Paul did. This is a warning. Somehow he found some sort of numerological code. By the way, he called himself a Christian numerologist, the guy who got yesterday wrong. Can I tell you something? After having spent four years in uh, undergrad and a couple more years in grad studies, spending the last 25 years of my life around Christian studies and academics, there is no such thing as a Christian numerologist, okay? So if anyone tells you they found some sort of magical number code in the Bible, or, or they have figured out that there's this magic code, you can probably just go ahead and sleep peacefully knowing that that guy doesn't know what he's talking about and kindly shake your head at him and go, that's, 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 that's real cute. And then roll your eyes and you turn around and walk away. What am I saying? There's a point. This prophecy to Paul and the prophecies of Jesus' return are not so much warnings as they're alert to what is going to happen. In fact, the reality is, when you start to go to Revelation, it's not a warning about, oh, this is the dreaded day of Jesus that's coming. It's a warning to remain faithful. In fact, it's not a warning. It's an encouragement to stay faithful. I'm going to alert you to the things that are going to happen, says Jesus to John. Paul, here's what's going to happen, says Agabus to Paul and his companions. It is alert of this is the world in which we live, and this is what's going to happen. And the promise that Paul knows, and the promise that the numerologist guy didn't really emphasize when he spoke of the return of Jesus, is that no matter what happens in this world, we have hope anyway. In fact, when we get to the end of this, spoiler alert, what Agabus says comes true. Our third point, our third point is the product of Paul's trip is going to be an arrest, in case you want to fill that blank in before Mike puts it up. The truth is, Paul will later say during this arrest to the Philippians that for me personally, it would be better if they had killed me in Jerusalem. Because for me personally, that would be gain. But the ability to stay here is to be alive, which is for the profit of you and for others. In fact, the reason Paul is bound and determined to go to Jerusalem is because Paul believes this is the continuation of his missionary journey, not the end of his journey. It's another opportunity to share with people the truth of who Jesus is and what Jesus has done. That's why when he arrives in Jerusalem, he speaks to the James and the brothers and says, this is what we have seen accomplished in our mission work. It's a continuation. In fact, Paul will write to those same churches of Ephesus in the secular letter he writes to Asia Minor. Ephesians chapter 6. Here's what Paul says at the end of this trip as he's writing on his way to, through chapters 22 through 26. 
Pray also for me that whenever I open my mouth, words may be given me so that I will fearlessly make known the mystery of the gospel. In other words, let me reveal the truths of the gospel that we know, but others haven't got to the last page yet. They're not sure who done it. Let me tell them that Jesus did it on the cross for salvation, which I am an what? ambassador in chains. When we pick up the story, Paul will find himself next week bound for Rome because of what he decides to do in the legal process. Paul says, I'm not going as a prisoner. I'm going as one who represents the message and, the, and as the messenger of Jesus Christ. This prophecy isn't a warning not to go, and it's alert of the opportunities that await. The reality is, the message that Jesus is coming back is not a warning of what we shouldn't do. It's a reminder of what we're called to do. Jesus says that we should look up. We should be prepared. We should remain faithful. It also is a warning to those who do not know that we as the ambassadors have the message of the mystery, which means we have a responsibility to tell the story, to let people know what happened on the last page, and that they themselves do not need to be the victim of eternal death in the cover of their own history. So, Paul knows what's going to happen. Paul meets with the brothers, he meets with James, and they let him know why there's a chance he can get arrested. They let him know what's happened to his reputation in Jerusalem. No longer is he seen as the fair-haired Pharisee. Who was second in command to Gamaliel, a great leader upon the Sanhedrin. Oh no, there's a rumor going around that Paul, you're an enemy of Judaism. Pick up with me in verse 20. When they heard this, they praised God. Then they said to Paul, you see brothers, how many thousands of Jews have believed and all of them were zealous in the law. They have been informed that you teach all the Jews who live among the Gentiles to turn away from Moses, telling them not to circumcise their children or live according to our customs. Which is interesting because this journey began with Timothy, whose mother was Jewish, whose father was a Gentile, who had not been circumcised, but had been spending his life raised around and in within the religion of Jerusalem. And what was the first or Judaism? And what was the first thing Paul did to him? Circumcised. Circumcised him. Where's the first place Paul goes? Everywhere on his journey, he says? To the synagogue to tell them the truth that Jesus is the fulfillment of the hope of Messiah they're looking for. But the word in Jerusalem is. This Paul, he's trying to destroy, Jeru destroy Judaism. Replace it with some sort of pagan religion focused on this fellow Jesus. What shall we do? They will certainly hear that you have come. So, do what we tell you. Here's the appeal. Here's the proposal to Paul and an appeal to Paul. Why don't you appeal to them? Why don't you show them your faithfulness to the law? Here's what you do. There are four men with us who have made a vow. Take these men, join in their purification rites, and pay their expenses so that they can have their heads shaved. Then everybody will know there is no truth in these reports about you, but you yourself are living in obedience to the law. As for the Gentile believers, we have written to them our decision that they should abstain from food sacrificed to idols, from blood, from the meat of strangled animals, and from sexual morality. You've emphasized everything we asked you to emphasize at that last council meeting. Why don't you prove to the town here that you are still a follower of your heritage, that you, you're not destroying Judaism. You see it as the fulfillment of Judaism. The next day, Paul took them in and purified himself along with them. Then he went to the temple to give notice of the date which the per and when the days of purification would end and the offering would be made for each of them. Paul follows the whole process and says, by the way, we'll be back in a week. Why? If Jesus has purified us, why go through a purification ritual? Why can't Paul pull that whole speech he pulls the Galatians? That there is nothing left in the law to fulfill because Jesus has fulfilled it. Why? Try to keep 
the traditional ceremonial cleanness, knowing that it's not what goes on on the outside of a man that makes him unclean, but what goes on the inside of a man that makes him unclean, said Jesus. What does it mean if water cannot cleanse the outside of the body, or the, it may cleanse the outside of the body, but it cleanses the inside of the body? The only thing that can do that is the application of the power of the blood of Jesus Christ. Why does Paul do this? Because Paul knows this is an opportunity. I think the reason he tells him exactly when he's coming back is Paul is determined that this is going to be the day I get to preach a sermon on what purification really is. On the fact that you can shave your head all you want and you can vow all you want but the reality is, you can't keep the words of your vows without breaking them. You can't control your eternal destiny any more than you can know the number of hairs in your head, but the one who does can. Amen. I think Paul's getting ready to kind of rev up his own version of Jesus' sermon on the mount. And then point to the one who gave the sermon on the mount. On the mountain is the fulfillment of this sermon when he went from teaching on one to dying on the other. And it's also the way that Paul has approached his entire time in ministry. He defends his approach in ministry when it comes to the Corinthians when he said this, Though I am free and belong to no man, I made myself a slave to everyone to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law. Though I myself am not under the law, because Jesus has fulfilled the law. So as to win those under the law. So Paul goes away. He has kept the practice. He has paid for it. He has encouraged it. He has endorsed it. So clearly, everyone now, knowing that he's coming back, has won over their favor, and they can't wait to see Paul, right? Well, let's keep reading. Wait, you already know the answer, because I already gave you the third point. The end product of this whole event is going to be his arrest. Luckily for Paul, or, based on what he said in Philippians, maybe not. Pick it up in verse 27. When the seven days were nearly over, some Jews from the province of Asia saw Paul at the temple. They stirred up the whole crowd and seized him, shouting, Men of Israel, help us. This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against our people. False accusation. Not true. And our law and this place. Just fulfilled the law and is coming to this place to keep a, a vow. But, you know, if you want to believe that... Uh, I almost want to say, I don't know, I'm not going to tell you what, we would use, what some would use to refer to that right now. They had previously been to Trophimus, and the Ephesian, they had previously seen Trophimus, the Ephesian in the city with Paul, and assumed that Paul had brought him into the temple area. The temple has got three different areas. There's the general court, and there's the court of the people, which is where Jewish men and women could gather. The general court outside is where the Gentile Trophimus might be allowed to stay. And then there's the court of Israel, which is where only the men are. So what they're saying is he brought this Gentile in here. Uh, nobody can find him, but that's their accusation. St. Paul's defiling the temple by allowing an outsider in here. He doesn't care anymore. And then they go on. The whole city was aroused. And the people came running from all directions. Seizing Paul, they dragged him into the temple, and immediately the gates were shut. Well, this is fun. Hey, Paul, let's take you even farther. Let's take you to the temple itself, and let's slam the door shut. I'm sure what we're going to do now is going to be a fun discussion. Oh, no, no, hold on. This looks like something right out of an episode of WWE at this point. <laughs> While they were trying to kill him, news reached... Oh, wait. Oh, so that's what they did behind the, sh the closed doors. This is that moment when Vito Corleone's men show up to your house and uh, they ask your wife to step outside and they shut the door behind her. This is the moment where you hear the grunts and the breaking and the snapping of bones. Th this is the plan. We're just going to beat this fellow to death right here in the temple. 
Because this man who tried to desecrate the temple, here's what we're going to do. We're going to violate one of the Ten Commandments, the one where thou shalt not murder. Isn't this wonderful? This is why Paul knows though these people need the message. They're trusting in a false sense of righteousness. Because, as he will say to the Romans in chapter 3, because you had the law, did that make you obedient to the law? No. It makes you aware that you have broken the law. And I don't know if there's any greater moment than the moment when you take a man into the temple, outside the veil of the Holy of Holies, and decide, let's murder him right here. Keep reading. While they were trying to kill him, news reached the commander of the Roman troops, and the whole city of Jerusalem was in an uproar. Now, one thing you don't want to do is get the Romans involved, because the last thing the Romans want is any sort of riot or any sort of problem that could lead to uh, any sort of stories getting back to Rome. So the Romans step in. He at once took some officers and soldiers and ran down to the crowd. When the rioters saw the commander of the soldiers, they, they stopped beating on Paul. The commander came up and, and arrested him and ordered Paul to be bound with two chains. Not the wrapper, by the way. Actually held in two chains. That joke didn't work at all. All right, we'll move on. <laughs> then my favorite part. Then they asked, who is this fella and what's he done? That's always one of great arrest moment. Uh, anybody want to tell me? i got to fill out the paperwork. Who did we just arrest and what did he do? Then they start canvassing the crowd. Nobody can give them a straight answer. That's my favorite part. Some in the crowd shouted one thing and some another. And since the commander couldn't get to the truth because of the uproar, he ordered, uh, let's just take Paul and get him out of here for now. Put him in the holding tank in the barracks. When Paul reached the steps, the violence of the mob was so great, he had to be carried by the soldiers. The crowd that followed kept shouting away with him. And this is my favorite part. As the soldiers were about to take Paul into the barracks, he asked the commander, uh, may I say something to you? The guy's absolutely shocked because he said it in a Greek language and he understood him. He said, do you, you speak Greek? We thought you were that Egyptian who started a revolt and led 4,000 terrorists out into the desert some time ago. Paul said, uh, fellas, I'm a Jew. I'm a Jew from Tarsus. You may remember that. It's a major kind of Roman colony city uh, over there in Asia Minor in Silica. A citizen of no ordinary city. Uh, please let me speak to the people. So Paul gets his chance to preach. We'll talk about that next week. Paul gets arrested for doing the wrong thing or for doing the right thing. This is a it's one of those uh, rhetorical questions you can answer out loud if you like, maybe it's just a regular question. Paul gets arrested for doing the right thing at the temple or the wrong thing? Joe, Paul gets arrested for doing the right thing the or the right wrong thing. thing? He gets arrested for doing the right thing. He gets slandered for all kinds of things. <laughs> the ambassador is ambassador. The ambassador is fulfilling his goal of trying to keep the law so that he may win some under the law. The truth is, those under the law do the wrong thing. This is where we look at the Bible and say, this is just crazy. Didn't Paul know what he should have done? Hadn't Paul read the Old Testament? It is the part where you pull one of those Elijah moments out and call down fire from heaven and watch it just zap them all. I mean, has he not even heard what happened in Jerusalem only, uh, only 16 chapters ago? There was Ananias and Sapphira. They lied. They didn't tell the truth. And the next thing you know, what went from them donating a part of their land turned into somebody having to use part of that land to bury him because they dropped dead. What do we do when what's supposed to happen and when we do the right thing, we get the wrong result? What do we do in a world where wrong is rewarded and right is punished? We do a lot of prayer. 
It's not Paul who answers this question for us. It's Peter. Peter answers a question to people when this treatment of Paul became more common throughout the land of the Roman Empire about a decade later. Here's what he said. First Peter chapter, that should be chapter 3, not chapter 1. First Peter chapter 3, verse 13. Who is going to harm you if you're eager to do good? Well, there's some guys at the temple in Jerusalem. Probably somebody reading this letter in Peter's day said there's some people in my town who've harmed us for doing what's good. Peter says, but even if you should suffer for what is right, you are blessed. That Sermon on the Mount that I think Paul was revving up to tell, it was Jesus who said, blessed are you when you're persecuted for my name's sake. Do not fear what they fear. Do not be frightened. What's the fear of this group in Jerusalem? That they're going to lose their temple? That they're going to lose their power? That Paul somehow is going to take away their specialness? Same Romans who came in to take Paul out of the situation will be the same Romans who in 70 AD will take out the temple. The reality of the message of Judaism is it still is fulfilled not in the hope of the people being faithful, but in the reality of God's faithfulness and that his faithfulness was completed in Jesus Christ. So don't fear what they fear, says Peter. But instead, understand that to be the truth and then, verse 15, set apart in your heart Christ as Lord. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you. To give the reason for the hope that you have. Which, by the way, Paul will do in the next few chapters over and over and over again. Our answer isn't that we go through life thinking that everything will go wonderful. The question is, how do we go about life setting apart Christ as Lord in our heart? How do we hold on hope when the world's upside down? Do we hold on to him or do we decide to fear what they fear and act like they lack? But do this with gentleness and respect. Don't, don't, don't listen to Mike there when he said that we should call down fire from heaven. <laughs> don't, don't act like Mike when he said, you know, wouldn't it be better if, he, if Paul just prayed for their deaths? He's an apostle. He should have that kind of power. keeping a clear conscience. So that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. It is better if it is God's will to suffer for doing good than for evil. Paul, it's better to go to Jerusalem and get arrested than to stay in Syria and not do what you feel you're called to do. And the example for us, the example for Paul, and the hope that we have is the one whom we set apart. Because Peter says it this way, for Christ died for sins once for all, the righteous for the unrighteous, to bring you to God. He was put to death in the body, but made alive by the Spirit. Amen. The return to Jerusalem for Paul. This was more than just a visit to talk to the twelve. This is more than just coming for an elders conference. This is the first time we really see Paul back at the temple. You know the last time in this book we saw Paul at the temple? It was way back in chapter 7. In chapter 7... It wasn't Paul who was doing the righteous things while they were being treated unrighteously. It was Paul who stood approvingly, holding the brute squad's cloaks while they threw stones 
at Stephen, who righteously explained the message of the Gospel. The reason that we see Paul in chapter 21 even willing and able to do what he does is because the transformation has taken place in his life that the truth that Jesus died for the unrighteous included even him. That's right. In fact, when you come to 1 Corinthians 15, he said that Jesus died for sinners of which I am the chief or the biggest. Paul doesn't go to Jerusalem to be the one who condemns the world. But he's the one who goes peacefully and gently letting them know that there's hope for men who already find themselves condemned by their sin. And that hope comes in Jesus Christ. That's right. The reason we live differently in a world that goes crazy is because we have received sanity again thanks to what Jesus did for us. The reason that we hold our faithfulness in a world that's unfaithful is because even if we were faithless, says Paul to Timothy, Jesus is faithful. The reason that Paul will endure hardship for the sake of trying to win a few is because the one he followed faced death and death on a cross for the whole world, so that if anyone believed in him, they would not perish in their sins, but they could receive eternal life. The encouragement of Paul in this story is the same encouragement he will give to the Corinthians when he tells them, follow me as I follow Jesus. As we see warnings, do we see them as, or as we see concerns of the future, do we see that as a warning to fall away from the fray? Or do we see an alert of what to encounter? As we see people who are looking through a menagerie of religious ideas, do we see that as an obstacle or an opportunity to appeal to them that hope comes in Jesus and Jesus alone? And may we see that no matter what it may produce, if it comes to opposition, we still do it for the hope that some may come. And the reality that no matter what may happen, we are still blessed. Because the one who didn't just say it on Corregidor, but the one who said it to his apostles, shall return. And when he returns, he tells John, he returns in victory and he's coming back for and to reward his people. If today, as our worship team comes, maybe you need to have a relationship with him. That's our first invitation. Maybe you've been struggling with how do I engage or disengage from the world. May we be encouraged to follow Paul's example as he followed Jesus's. Let's stand for this morning's invitation.